In this video, we're going to talk about photosynthesis. So, first up, the specification dictates that we must know how to define the terms autotroph and heterotroph. So, autotrophs are organisms that use light energy as well as inorganic molecules, and with this, they, they, they synthesize complex organic molecules. Whereas heterotrophs kind of, you could say, feed on the autotrophs. Therefore, they ingest and digest these complex organic molecules, uh, which releases the chemical potential energy stored inside them. It also asks us to explain how respiration in plants and animals really depends on the products of photosynthesis. So let's have a look. The products of photosynthesis, as you know, uh, well you should do anyway, otherwise you're going to fail, are glucose and oxygen, C6H12O6 plus O2. Now, if you put this in a respiration equation, these are the only uh, reactants. C6H12O6 plus 6 oxygens gives you 6 carbon dioxides and 6 water molecules. So I'm going to quickly go over the chloroplast structure. So chloroplasts basically have two membranes, uh, much like mitochondrion. This topic is very similar to respiration. So if you remember in uh, mitochondrion, the inner membrane kind of folds uh, to form something called cristae. It kind of folds in and out rather than what I'm about to show you now. The inner membrane in a chloroplast essentially does the same thing but doesn't fold uh, to form like the little mountainous ridges you saw in the mitochondrion. It actually folds into like disc shapes and each one of these discs is known as a thylakoid or a thylakoid depending on your pronunciations. So a stack of these thylakoid discs is called a granum. So just remember a granum is many thylakoid discs and each thylakoid, although you may see it called lamellae, it doesn't really mean that. Basically, that just refers to the folding. Like in mitochondria, it's called cristae. And the fluid filled uh, space in the middle is called the stroma. So, obviously, as you can see here, you've got the stroma. And now uh, we're going to go to the thylakoids and we're going to zoom in a lot and look at uh, the membrane structure. So, what I'm basically drawing here is uh, quickly the thylakoid structure and uh, the phospholipids and all that jazz and something in the middle. So obviously this is the membrane as you can see, the top part is the stroma and the bottom part is the thylakoid space which is in between the two membranes. And what we've got here in the middle is a photosystem, I'm just now going to zoom in on that to make it nice and clearer for you guys. So the photosystem is essentially a collection of photosynthetic pigments and photosynthetic pigments uh, they're molecules that essentially absorb light energy. Each pigment is a uh, each pigment is different, and they all have their own ranges of wavelength of light they can absorb. So what we've got here is the funnel-shaped uh, uh, photosystem, and these little squares I'm drawing here, these are all the different types of photosynthetic pigments that kind of link together in this photosystem. And at the bottom here, we've got something called the primary pigment reaction center. And the primary pigment reaction center is always chlorophyll A. So what happens is light strikes basically each and every uh, photosynthetic pigment really. This includes the, the reaction center at the bottom. But the ones at the top and all of them, they all kind of share their energy. And the energy gets passed along right to the very bottom of the primary pigment reaction center. Which here excites a pair of electrons, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So basically all the energy at the minute is uh, passed on to our chlorophyll A structure. So at the minute, if you still remember, if you're still with me guys, we've got the pigments, yeah? And the energy is passed along from these pigments to chlorophyll A. These pigments include chlorophylls. So not only is the bottom one chlorophyll A, we've got some other pigments included there in them squares I showed. These are called chlorophyll B. But the two primary chlorophylls, chlorophyll A, the primary pigment reaction centers we need to know about, are uh, P680 and P700. This number just represents the wavelength of light they absorb. So, between all the chlorophyll pigments, you absorb the blue light and the red light. So, the whole purpose of the accessory pigments is essentially to absorb the wavelengths of light that are not well absorbed by chlorophylls which obviously this essentially maximises the light absorbance, the amount of energy that can be processed here. And the two main accessory pigments we need to know about are called carotene and xanthophyll, and these uh, absorb the orange and yellow colours, the wavelengths of light respectively. So, if you're with me still, so the light so far has kind of hit all the pigments really, and they've been passed along to the primary pigment reaction centre. 
But don't forget, the primary pigment Rex and Center also uh, absorbs its own light. It doesn't just sit at the bottom and wait for the energy from the others. It also absorbs its own light between 680 and 700. So what I'm drawing right now is a thylakoid membrane. We've got the stroma up the top and the thylakoid space at the bottom. Uh, all these squiggly lines are obviously just going to be your basic phospholipids that make up uh, the bilayer membrane. Uh, PS2, Photosystem 2 is our Photosystem on the left and Photosystem 1 is our one on the right. In the middle there, them squiggly things, uh, they are our electron carriers, our electron transport proteins. So now I'm going to talk about how photosynthesis technically really occurs. This is called uh, the light dependent stage, the light dependent part of photosynthesis. Light strikes photosystem 2 and obviously this is going to strike not only the accessory pigments the chlorophyll but also chlorophyll a the primary pigment reaction center this is going to cause uh, an electron pair to leave so also light is actually hitting photosystem 1 at the same time this causes the electrons to leave photosystem 1 these electrons are then replaced by photosystem 2 the electrons that came from photosystem 2 when that was struck by light so the electrons from PS1 travel up to here, I'm about to show you why and where they go in a moment. So, if you know respiration, do you remember how the electrons, as they go through proteins and electron acceptors and carriers, what happens is, uh, the energy used of the movement of these electrons, it generates energy which causes H plus to be pumped across the membrane. This obviously creates a proton gradient, so H plus, the protons, obviously then go through ATP synthase, turning ADP and a phosphate generating ATP. So here we are, then have NADP which is essentially an electron and a proton carrier. It, uh, you get the NADP and then the two electrons I told you about a moment ago uh, that left photosystem 1. Not only have they pumped the H plus through, this H plus then comes back through obviously as I just said generating the ATP but they all combine together to form reduced NADP which I've written down as NADPH2. So, obviously Photosystem 2 has lost some electrons, it needs to get these back. Where do these come from? What happens is, the photolysis or photolysis, whatever you call it, however you like to pronounce it, uh, the, I call it photolysis, the photolysis of water occurs, and that basically means H2O is split up into two electrons, two protons, and some oxygen. So the electrons from that then replace those lost by Photosystem 2 earlier on. Light hits photosystem 2, so this causes a pair of electrons to leave photosystem 2 and travel to photosystem 1. This is because a pair of electrons has also been lost from photosystem 1 because light has also hit photosystem 1. The electron flow is obviously then used to pump the H plus across the membrane which can then go through ATP synthase to produce ATP. Obviously the electrons, the H plus and NADP all react together to make reduced NADP. The electrons from the photolysis of water then replace the electrons lost by photosystem 2. So, the products of this overall is ATP, half molecule of oxygen, and then reduced NADP. This is known as non-cyclic photophosphorylation. So now, cyclic photophosphorylation. Once again, I'm just drawing the basic diagram of the membrane. Cyclic photophosphorylation only really involves photosystem 1. So, light strikes photosystem 1. This causes electrons to obviously be released. Uh, the electrons then go to an electron carrier, which means the energy from these electrons can be used to pump H plus through, generating ATP. These electrons then go back through, back to photosystem 1, and it goes round and round again. So essentially, ATP is the only product. The electrons leave, generate the energy to push H plus through, which then produces ATP, then go back to photosystem 1 again. So they go round and round, just generating very small amounts of ATP. So now the Kelvin cycle, which occurs in the stroma. What happens is, you've got your enzyme Rubisco, and this basically catalyzes a reaction between carbon dioxide that the plant's taken in through the stomata, and something called RUBP, which we're going to generate shortly. And the products of this reaction are 2-glycerate phosphate. 
So, we then need to convert the glycerate phosphate to something else, but to do this we need to use the products of the light dependent reactions we've just done. The reduce NADP goes to oxidise NADP, and ATP is turned to ADP as the pi group, the phosphate group, is used during this reaction. This produces two molecules of triose phosphate, which then needs to be converted to RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate. However, to do this, we still need to use ATP again from the light dependent stage, converting that back to ADP, and the phosphate group is used once again. So essentially, you need to remember here that the products of the light dependent reaction, the ATP and the reduced NADP, are then used. The two glycerate phosphate can be converted to amino acids. From there, you can make fatty acids, you can make lipids, uh, and the triose phosphate are mainly used to make hexo sugars such as glucose. Obviously, you can then turn this into cellulose, starch, you can combine it with fructose to make sucrose, all sorts of things like this. Five out of every six of the TP molecules are in fact converted to RUBP, though. So, one out of six can therefore be used to make these hexo sugars. So what I'm just going to quickly show you here is basically the limiting factors such as light intensity is the example I'm going to use and the Kelvin cycle. On the left we've got the concentration of uh, our ribulose bisphosphate, our, our triose phosphate and our glycerate phosphate and this is compared in bright light and dim light which obviously means in bright light you've got lots of light dependent reactions happening and in dim light not so many. So this means in bright light if you've got lots of light dependent reactions occurring you're going to get a lot of the products of them reactions, which means you've got a lot of ATP and a lot of reduced NADP. Obviously, as we know, ATP and reduced NADP, as we just saw a minute ago, are used to make RUBP and TP. So if you've got a lot of stuff that makes RUBP and TP, we're therefore going to have high concentrations of RUBP and TP. However, as you know, glycerate phosphate is also used to make these. This means you can have lower concentrations of GP. But in dim light, that means there's going to be less ATP made and less reduced NADP, which means not as much GP is converted into triose phosphate and RUBP. That means you've got more GP, so the concentration of GP in dim light increases greatly. Once again, it's pretty self-explanatory. If you've got a lot more GP, that means less GP is being converted, so less products are going to be made. So you've got lower concentrations of RUBP and TP.